Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Lynn Tomaszewski. I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs here at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. And it is um, wonderful. Thank you all for coming out. We're in our last week of the semester. So um, those of you Cranbrook students, you know, try to move around. This will be conversational, I hear. So we're all um, running on fumes here. So um, thank you for coming. Um, this is the third lecture in our academy-wide lecture series this year. And um, all of these are, um, and obviously Chinupa Hanska Luger is here. Um, it, this lecture series is supported by the generosity of the Gilbert Family Foundation. So we always want to thank them. Um, and without further ado, I'll tell you a little bit about Chinupa and um, hand the mic over metaphorically um, for his talk. So Chinupa Hanska Luger is a New Mexico-based multidisciplinary artist creating monumental installation, sculpture, and performance to communicate urgent stories of 21st century indigeneity. Incorporating ceramics, steel, fiber, video, and repurposed materials, Luger activates speculative fiction, engages in land-based actions of repair, and practices empathetic response through social collaboration. Born on the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, Luger is an enrolled member of the three affiliated tribes of Fort Berthold, Berthold, yeah. Mandan, Hidatska, Arikara. Mandan, Hidatska, and Arikara. Okay. Yeah. All wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. And Lakota. And Lakota. Mm -hmm. Luger combines critical cultural analysis with dedication and respect for the diverse materials, environments, and communities he engages. His bold visual storytelling presents new ways of seeing our collective humanity while foregrounding an indigenous worldview. His work can be seen nearby at the University of Michigan Museum of Art in an exhibition titled You're Welcome through February 2024. If you haven't seen it, get there. It's, it's up for a few more months. Luger is the recipient of numerous fellowships, including Soros, a Guggenheim, a United States Artist Fellowship for Craft, as well as a 2021 Grist Fixer. Additionally, he is a 2020 Creative Capital Fellow, a 2020 Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow, and is the recipient of the Museum of Art and Design's inaugural Burke Prize, among many other awards. Luger has exhibited nationally and internationally at prestigious venues, including the National Gallery of Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Gardner Museum in Toronto, Kunst Hall, K Cade in the Netherlands, the Art Gallery of Alberta, Canada, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas, and the National Center for Civil Rights and Human Civil and Human Rights in Georgia, among others. Luga holds a BFA in Studio Arts from the Institute of American Indian Arts and is represented represented by Garth Green and Gallery in New York. It is my pleasure um, to welcome Chinupa Hanska Luger. Find my light on my eyelashes. Thank you. Docha Maragua. Dishkag Nahudosha Nitue Hudosha. I'm Chinupa Hanska Luger. I'm Awahe. I'm Dripping Earth Clan from the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes. These are uh, the three affiliate, affiliated tribes of uh, North Dakota. We're like river people. So, Missouri River, long history with the river. Um, that's on my mom's side. That's where I'm enrolled. That's where I'm a citizen. Um, but my father's Lakota, and um, there's European uh, on both sides of my family. My mother's side is Scandinavian, so there's like Norwegian connections. And then on my dad's side, it's Austro-German, so hence Luger, last name. Um, I didn't learn much about my European uh, uh, ancestry or, or any of that sort of stuff. So I was raised in standing, on the Standing Rock Reservation, which is a... Um, it's a Hunkpapa Lakota reservation. That's where my dad's from. Um, he, my family has a cattle ranch there, so I would spend my summers with my dad and spend the rest of the year with my mom. My parents divorced when I was young, so I was kind of moving back and forth and always in transition, it always felt like. But North Dakota has like consistently been home. Um, and we had a few conversations today around these ideas of home and, and um, as I was engaging with the some, some members from the ceramic department. Uh, 
I think these are really important questions. Like, uh, really what it is is about a sense of belonging. Like, uh, I, as, I, as I travel around and I engage um, in different, different communities, different places, different uh, uh, venues and institutions, there seems to be like a, oh, shoots. Let me start this machine up. Um, there seems to be a overall kind of sense of displacement or like a desire to belong to place. Um, I do have a, some work up in Michigan presently and it was kind of addressing some of these conversations at uh, the University of Michigan and there's these like tropes that I keep seeing as I, as I travel around, particularly here in the United States around um, a perceived kind of uh, deep time relationship to the landscape. And oftentimes that takes place in our architecture and so it inhabits the space that we cruise through and we see um, with the project at uh, uh, the University of Mi Michigan Museum of Art, it was a question of how do we remember and it was in relationship to uh, a building. There's a, the Alumni Memorial Hall and it's a you know, neoclassical Greco-Roman architecture, this architecture that we're used to seeing, you know, our, our libraries, our schools, our federal buildings, they all have this kind of like overarching narrative. Um, but it's like a, it's an illusion of a deep time to place and so, I think this is one of the privileges that I have as a as a indigenous person in North America is that we have these like deep time relationships to place and I understand how like valuable that is when I go home. I say I'm I'm river people. Like I find familiarity um, just about along any river, but particularly in North Dakota, um, along the Missouri River, there's like geology that has these stories, these stories that are embedded with um, uh, myths, you know, these like uh, culture stories, these heroes and these monsters, and they're all entangled in the, in the geology. They're entangled in the landscape. And some of our customary practices are also entangled in landscape. Um, one component to that that I'm always kind of fascinated with and have explored in many different ways is one of our customary ways of making songs, which was, we used to do this thing where um, we're kind of, we're in the Midwest, if you're um, not from the West, I guess, if you're on the East Coast, this is Midwest. I always feel like everything east of the Mississippi uh, is east in, in my head, but this is my own, my own geo geography embedded in my head. But these like rolling plains, I don't, I don't imagine you have to go far here in Michigan to see the, the plains or these rolling hills. We had a customary practice of, of creating songs by standing on the landscape and following the rise and fall in those hills. And then we would rotate in a 360 degree rotation and that would become a, let's say it's a graphic score for composition. You would sing that horizon line. That would be the rise and fall in tone. Now you wouldn't nail it specifically, but if you were informed, you could go to places based on the songs that you sing. Like where was this song composed? How was it composed? And it was composed by looking at the land. The land informed the melody of the song. And then you would bring in rhythm and language to, to um, fill in all of those spaces. The thing that was interesting to me about that, I mean, one, I think it's really cool because it's <laughs> my peeps and where I'm from, but I, there's something in looking at the land as inspiration. That you look at the land with reverence rather than examining it as a, as a resource, you know? And, and examining that relationship, um, it's generative. And you recognize the generosity of the landscape rather than the limitations of the resources that are available. It's like, well, let's consider other things that we can, we can examine it for, that we can exist with it. Um, how does it not belong to me, but I belong to it? And embedding the landscape in song and culture and music and stuff like that, it's a really you know, um, grounding way to identify your relationship to place. It's, uh, it's embedded in the, in the customs, it's embedded in, in the cultural practices, 
And in doing so, you always are reminded of that. Um, these are kind of like some of the core values from which I've generated work, but I'm also, I'm also playing in the realms of, of I don't know, the, there's a lot of terms going around. Indigenous futurism is one of the, you know, um, uh, codes to type in on your computer to find <laughs> my work or something along those lines. But I always think of them as just like, okay, these are search words, you know? Um, I don't, futurism scares, scares me. Like the, the narrative of futurism, where the origin of the term futurism comes from, there's something inherently like fascist in imagining other people's futures, which, uh, you know, makes me uncomfortable. But because that is the language that we, we use to describe ideas, I'm happy to utilize indigenous futurism or futurism in, in the sense of um, imagining myself or my culture in a, distance, in a distant place. And that response is really around examining um, indigenous bodies, indigenous culture as object. Um, removing the context of objects sitting in museums, sitting in, in uh, books, you know, sitting in ways, uh, sitting in photography, sitting in, in ways in which it's described is, um, it's always relegated to the past in, in a way. And, um, and then entangled with that is any sort of spirituality or technology that was developed through these contexts or like limited to a, a primitive narrative, you know? And there's, there's all of these language things that, are, that complicate these, the ideas of, of uh, indigenous voice, indigenous art, um, and then indigenous bodies in relationship to the Americas. And a lot of it falls into how we, how we talk about it, how we describe it. And there's a lot of complexity and, and um, confusion around uh, how to address that in the present. And the, the present is a, is a tricky place to address all of these things because we don't have, uh, native people in, in North America don't have a diasporic uh, uh, tradition. We have not been completely removed from the landscape and we don't have a, a singularity in our, in our culture or an anchor point to like connect us all Simultaneously, there's policy and other sorts of things that do lump us under the, these umbrella terms, but there is complexity in the regions. Like our cultures, because they're related to land, the diversity of the landscape also informs the diversity of the cultures. And um, for me, it was easier to imagine a future space where all of these difficult and awkward conversations become moot. So I'm like, let's talk about our future. Let's talk about us existing in a future context in which all of the complexity and the problems that we're examining in the present, um, let's imagine them as such a, a bad move in the, in the trajectory of the human experience that we forgot, we forgot about all of these delineations, these lines, these narratives that have like separated us and isolated us. We don't even talk about it anymore. Like it was such a bad move. Uh, when we think about our ancestors who had these practices, um, uh, we forgive them for a poor direction in in our collective movement. You know, and now we're developing something new. Playing within the realm of speculative fiction um, allows me to bypass all of that complexity and develop. Uh, practices that are inherent in a cultural context, but they would be relevant for, uh, for future generations. So this whole body of work that I've been playing around with was called, uh, or is called Future Ancestral Technologies. And, um, and it, it's, it's sprung a bunch of weird ideas that I'm kind of like navigating and probably poorly executing at present. I, you know, the future me is gonna nail this at some point, but the present me is still struggling with how do you describe this? Um, and I talked about it briefly today as well, but it's um, space time. I'm like, space time continuum. What a, weird, what a weird and fun thing. If we're gonna talk about futurism and we're gonna talk about navigating through time, um, let us not be limited by the linear directionality of time as we understand it presently. And if there is 
uh, uh, collective futurist, uh, and I'm talking like global indigenous arc and narrative of time, it is not linear. You know, it's not limited to a trajectory that is this is the past, this is the future, because we are constantly traveling through space and time. And I, and I think it's interesting, like, why have we not developed time machine? Because we've developed a time machine. Like, our existence is a, is a model of that, and our continuum, our relationships, our generations, our genes, they are navigating through space and time constantly. You have recollections, you have m genetic memory, you know, of things, and you don't even know why you know this, but there it is, you know? I'm like, rather than developing a mechanism to travel through uh, time, what if we recognize that we are and you actually figure out a way to describe what you're actually doing, you know, that the mechanism exists. And so I'm playing around with that idea. I'm like, how do we, how do, we do that? And I, and I think embedded in um, my cultural context, this is like, you know, Mandan, primarily Mandan traditions. There's Hidatsa uh, stories and myths that I entangle, but um, the tribe that I'm enrolled on, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikar, are three tribes that were all river people, and smallpox like decimated our population. So at the point of reservation period, there, we, there weren't enough of each of those tribes individually for the um, U.S. to allot land to, to the people. And so collectively they decided under much conversations and disagreements there was a consensus that was developed and the three affiliated tribes was, was um, kind of culminated. Uh, but if you're from Fort Berthold, like everybody from there, we're all, all three of those tribes genetically at some point, but most of us kind of like anchor towards two of the three, you know, just from like uh, sex, ultimately. It's like, who's your dad? Who's your mom? You know, where are they from? What are these, what are these lines? How does that connect? So I was born uh, and raised with a lot more knowledge around Mandan and Hidatsa cultures than I was around Arikara. Um but we were all like clay people. We had all of these things, and it was stories that that navigated through um, through the line more than uh, material knowledge. So I came to ceramics late. Um, I mean, whatever that means. I I was I came I came to it in a really weird way. We actually I was briefly talking about it. Um, I came I came to ceramics because of the 2012. Uh, Mayan calendar end and my thought that there was going to be an apocalypse. I was a painter prior to that or a drawer with color is the other thing that I learned in my undergrad. I don't actually know how to paint. Um, I can draw with color all day though. Uh, my painting teacher used to stand behind me in my painting class and he was like really encouraging me to uh, <laughs> push paint as he called it. He would stand behind me every day and he would do this thing where he'd breathe in through the sides of his teeth. He'd go uh, and I would hear that first, you know, and I'm like, I knew exactly what he was going to say next. Chanupa, are you going to push some paint today? And uh, I was so cheap. I'm still cheap, but I was so cheap at that time, like paint was so expensive and uh, the materiality of it, you know, so I was like, don't commit, water it down, light washes, like layer it up if you really want it to be bold. But it, what I realized, I was like, I like, graphic work, I like drawing, I like, I like a hard line, I like uh, flat color, you know? And, um, and it was a lot more like drawing than it was painting. Anyway, all of that to be said, I, you know, 2012 came around, I was still in school, I graduated in 2011 and like leading up to that point, I, uh, I started thinking like, okay, if there is an apocalypse and the world transforms radically according to these, these calendars, like, how could I, I mean, obviously it happened and uh, it was subtle. We didn't realize it, but the world changed, you know, from that moment to this moment. Um, but we weren't eating each other. So the, I, I thought for sure there was gonna be a moment of eating each other, you know, in this thing. And I was like, they're gonna eat the, the painters first. Like, what good am I gonna be in this future context? Like, how am I gonna paint salvation for us, you know? Um, and so ceramics, I was like, I, I, I was obsessed with the utilitarian uh, application of ceramics and I kept exploring like really weird things like not your standard like um, dinnerware or something I was like I came across like 
Baghdad batteries, you know, these really like really strange things, you know, um, batteries that were found, uh, speculative batteries, we don't actually know what they were for, but I was like, battery sounds right, it'll work as a battery. Um, I was looking at uh, um, dual cham chambered vessels from Ethiopia that were used to store um, uh, food longer, so it was like a vessel within a vessel and the, in between the two walls was water. So one vessel floated inside of the other, and then just thermal dynamics, like the heating of the exterior would actually cool the interior, and I'm like, legit, that is cool, that'll be useful, they will not eat me. Um, and then instruments was another thing I thought was really, really fascinating. Like, how, do, how does a handful of clay fill a room, you know? And it's like, turn it into a whistle, you know? And you can, you, you can take up a lot of space with sound uh, and a little bit of clay. And uh, so that was like my movement into clay. Now, Customarily, my peeps were clay people. We made vessels, like it was entangled in our, in our cultural context. We had these uh, boats that are called bull boats. And the bull boat was um, easily dismantled and remade. And so when you live on a river, you could like hike upstream, find materials that were needed, food, other, other resources. And you could quickly make a bull boat by carrying a single buffalo hide and you just stretch it over this bull boat, and then you ride the current back to the community. And you would also make uh, vessels to store whatever goods it is. I'm gonna go get some June berries, you know? I'm gonna head upstream, carrying this, uh, uh, this one hide, and um, the landscape, the river is you know, abundant with clay. I, I found a vein on my, um, my grandparents' land that's like, miles and miles long and like eight feet deep, and, uh, uh, it's like slightly different clay everywhere I've dug and, and test fired it. Um, so I haven't found any legit consistency. But um, you know, all of this stuff like seemed like a really great way to explore um, uh, the knowledge of clay and the traditions of clay and why things take the forms that they take. Our, our vessels had rounded bottoms. They were great to cook in. Um, but also like, like the, uh, um, what is the Greek, amphora, 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 like you traveling materials with this rocky bottom rounded uh, uh, vessel, like counterbalances as you're you know, riding a, a, a river current back to the, back to the community. Um, that is the Missouri River. This is a project that I had done, the Mirror Shield project. I, I'm trying to give you guys a rough background of my, of my story um, and where my work kind of came from and out of, but I think where I was leading with that whole conversation is I didn't have ancestral knowledge. There were no, uh, there were no relatives who maintained the ceramic practices for the Mandan and the Hidatsa. The closest connect, I found like one paper from like 1990 something uh, that a, that a um, MHA uh, student somewhere wrote on, on our customary ceramic practices. Beyond that, like those rivers that I grew up on were flooded. Um, on the Missouri River, there's like, I don't know, five, let's say there's like five major dams on the, on the Missouri River. Like four of them are just downstream from a reservation. So there was like a, a methodology around annexing land and using uh, eminent domain to displace folks. And my reservation, like 42% of it is underneath Lake Sacagawea, um, which is on the Missouri River. But because we're river people, all of our villages were there too. So there's like you get removed from that history, right? Or at least it's underneath water and, and, and silt, but simultaneously it's also protected in a way um, from like uh, uh, theft and, and materials being displaced from communities. But like a lot of these pots and works, they also are like overseas. Um, I've only seen one sort of like Mandan pot in person, I've never touched one yet. I had this Smithsonian grant that was mentioned in the in the beginning of it, and there was also a, a an American Craft Council grant that I got simultaneously just before the pandemic, and uh, it was all built around doing research on our on our work and um, trying to bring pottery back to to my community. And then there's a pandemic, and it's like, oh, 
we can't actually uh, gather in any way, shape, or I couldn't even go to the Smithsonian. I was like back online looking at things online. I'm like, great grant. Like I, I had this access before, you know. Um, I'm interested in like how that changes or shifts or if I can go and explore it a little bit more. But what I found was working with clay is that there was like a recollection. You know, I didn't have this ancestral connection. I live in New Mexico and there are rich ceramic traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. And I'm always looking at it with like a little bit of envy, you know, where I'm like, mm, I wish I had an auntie who could teach me that or a grandmother or, you know, somebody who could um, guide me in these ways, tell me the songs for harvesting material, do all of this sort of stuff, but I don't have that. And, um, but working with the material, I was like, Clay did not, forget us, you know, like the, the material has memory, has knowledge, and the material taught me so much about how to be a good person, like I was born in 1979, so I'm an 80s baby, and I say this all the time because it's true, but I, I grew up on like MTV and sugar cereal, and I wanted everything immediately, you know, um, it was just like inherent in the culture that I was raised in, was this like instant, slick, uh, um, uh, narrative and it made me impatient and it made me expect a lot you know I was I was getting real entitled in my in my generation if there's any what, what generation are we X uh, Gen Xers in here that I'm like I don't know why they went with X they should have went with W because we pretty much whatevered our way through everything like whatever I was hoping we'd water whatever our way through power but I'm afraid Power is intoxicating, and we are maybe the worst, you know? Or at least we're on the tail end of, of, uh, of uh, a legacy, you know? Um, let's whatever it, though. Talk to your friends, Gen Xers. Let them, let them whatever the power onto the next generation. Um, but Clay taught me a whole bunch of stuff, um, and one of them was patience, and one was uh, expectation. I was like... Uh, all the clay people in here, and uh, really anybody working in, in with a close relationship to materiality, it's like um, you can expect certain things, but then the material itself also has agency. You know, it's gonna it's gonna destroy your hours. You know, if you don't do it right, but you learn from it, and and um, and that's nice. You know, this is that continuum. This is that time travel. Um, so Clay, Clay told me to be patient, um, to not expect anything, to enjoy the process. Like if you don't enjoy the process, pick up your acrylics again or do something else. You know, get in, get into another another thing that's a little bit um, uh, less entangled. It's funny I say that, but I don't know anything about painting, and I'm sure there are painters in here who are like, "Au contraire, my friend," like I, I labor at it for sure. Um, uh, I'm sure we all do. The material of clay, though, it was the ancestral connection that I was longing for, you know? It was the auntie and the grandmother. Um, it was the place in which all of these stories were held and um, encapsulated and sustained through this moment of my cultural history. Um, it was in there the whole time, and it was in me too, but it was, the, it was the connection of the two that reminded me that we knew each other, that we remembered each other. And I took to the material in a way that, um, I went to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in New Mexico, and my, my ceramic instructor um, was like, you're gonna produce more than I have on my syllabus, so I'm just putting you in the back of the room, like knock yourself out. And um, I really appreciated that. I was older when I came to, to school, um, so she was like, I don't need to hold your hand, and you seem pretty, that was out in the world, I was working, you know, I was like, college is great, you know, I'm like, this is so much easier than the world, um, and so I, you know, uh, uh, explored every facet and avenue that was available through the facilities at the, at the university, and I was like, I don't know who I am or what I am, I just know that I'm becoming, and some of these materials are going to inform me, you know, they're going to, they're going to remind me, um, and that's been pretty consistent throughout my practice. I, I worked with clay, fell in love with clay, started building with clay. I love the plasticity. Um, it actually, 
The thing I think I like the most about it is that when I first started working with it, clay took mark like drawing did. And I was like, oh, there's something in this. Like shading with my fingertips and, and moving and creating volume two-dimensionally uh, was very similar to working with clay. It's like additive and subtractive kind of materiality. I was like, oh, this, I, can, I can wrap my head around this. And then I found that clay actually made me a better drawer. Um, I'm also a dad, so I can catch things with reflexes. Luckily, that was a water bottle and not a knife, which is another thing that I do sometimes. Um, uh, this is a background. I just talked at you quite a bit, pretty hard. I'm actually interested in talking with you all. I know you had a long, you know, the end of a semester. Um, I actually enjoy a, a conversation, and I think it will guide um, this exchange. And honestly, like, I, I'm in it for that. I'm like, I don't, wh where are you all at? What are you all up to? Can you make a statement um, and hide it as a question or create a question um, that'll allow me to expound upon any of my practices? Um, worked with Clay. I will say Clay led me into, um, actually, I grew up on a cattle ranch in North Dakota. That's actually what led me into a bunch of stuff. like. Um, welding, that, mostly it's like there was never, we never had the resources to hire anybody to do anything, so you learn how to do things, you know, and you half-ass it until you get it right, you know. Um, and so that kind of worked uh, with material. Like when I jumped from painting to ceramic, there was also anchors and tethers in, in welding and steel fabrication um, because I'm a you know, 44-year-old man, there was a period in the 90s where, like, the only work for artists was construction. So that was a job that I did quite a bit, you know, uh, framing homes, roofing, all of this sort of stuff. It all seemed to be applicable at some point to my practice. I was like, ah, I'm so glad that my mom is an artist and my dad is a cattle rancher, and both of them are, like, the hardest working people like I, I've ever met, you know? Um, and just those two practices, they're insane. It's one thing that I really actually like about artists and the community of artists and craft people um, is that they spend most of their lives putting more in than they take out, you know? Um, and that's a rare thing in the, in the world presently. So kudos to all of you for going in this tra trajectory. Um, I think g the generation of things is, is uh, you know, always good, always strong, but I don't specialize in anything. I always move, shift. I haven't mastered a single skill yet, but I have, um, I'm moving towards it, you know, at some point there may be, I've definitely put in the hours to consider <laughs> mastering if 10,000 hours counts it, but if you spend 9,000 of them screwing up and messing around, I'm like, is that mastering yet? I don't know. Um, but there's all sorts of new materials. That's the other thing that's, that's interesting. Anyway, this slideshow is just rolling through and running on a loop. Um, if there's any moment, this is a pretty intimate crowd. We left the lights up so I could see you all. If you've got questions, comments, or anything like that, let's keep the, the story going until the end of it where we're in conversation. I am going to reiterate your questions or a microphone may come to you. They want to record the whole thing, so I'm just letting you know before you're like, why is he parroting me? Mm. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to redo that question. Can you mic it actually so that it's recorded? Because <laughs> I do like it. I think it's interesting. Yeah, um, I asked two questions. I asked if you worked while you were in school in that process of becoming, and if you did or if you did not, what was that process or experience of that process of becoming and being informed by your access to new materials like? Yeah. Um, I, I worked for sure while I was in school, but the work was going nowhere. I mean, as far as like, there was no market for, for the work that I was creating. Um, and this was like 
you know, I, w I was in school, my undergrad, um, which is the extent of my schooling. I didn't make it to, to grad school, but um, while I was there, it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Santa Fe, New Mexico is like a, um, it's the apex of the native art market and, and scene, you know? Um, my mother moved us off of the reservation when I was like two years old. Being an artist, there was no market for her in North Dakota for the work that she was creating, so she moved us into the Southwest to be close to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I presently live about 20 minutes from Santa Fe and from uh, the school that I went to, the Institute of American Indian Arts. And at the time, 2006 to 2011, um, oh man, there was radical change. There was like, uh, there were some strange things that happened. And I was like, pay attention, pay attention to this. Um, one, when there is a market for a margin, there is no drive or encouragement to become a part of the larger market because the smaller market can satiate what it means to provide for your family, right? Um, the problem with that is that the market is externalized, so it's dictating what it wants, and now this entire populace has to provide what they want, you know? And because that had happened since like the 1930s, um, up until that point, there was, um, there was a very romantic aesthetic and, um, and there were also like limitations on traditional materials to use, you know, that like the market was dictating um, what had value based on this. For me, I was like, what I kept thinking about was like, okay, you want a deep, like this market wants a deep time relationship to the Americas, right? Um, you see it in the renaming of rivers and mountains. You see it in the displacement and neglect of, of many populations. Um, when, when the native art sits in that position, you can buy contemporary work that looks like ancient work, and then you can have a dinner party and talk about this work as a part of that um, capped off history of, of a culture, you know, where it's like, even if they're alive today, thriving, surviving, and reproducing smaller versions of what they used to make before, uh, it still fit within the realm of traditional crafts, and that um, limited uh, an expression of an entire population. So when I was in school, the work that I was making, they were like, Maybe it's Indian art, like maybe it is, you know? And, I, and I'm trying to play within that realm because that was the only outlet and, and position and um, proximity to power that I saw available was like, kill it in the native art scene. It's set aside for me, there it is. Shit, I'll be Santa famous by friggin' Thursday, you know? And so right out of school, I got into um, a gallery and was having these complicated conversations where I was like, I'm like, let me reproduce your, let me make Indian art. I'm like, you don't get Mandan, Hidatsa, or Rikara work. You don't get customary, traditional work. You don't get the work that I would value and that I think is important is that really going to move the culture forward. I'm going to regurgitate what you value. And I'm going to present it as such. And I'm going to be bold in that expression. I'm like, oh, no, no, this is Indian art. You know, it's got feathers and beads. It's just, it's everything you wanted. And I would play this tongue-in-cheek game with these, with these forms, making figurative work, and they ate it up. They ate it up. So that's happening in school and more so right after school. There was, you know, that I started working with a gallery that was in Santa Fe um, that had a history of working with contemporary native art. You know, it was like one of, the, one of the top dogs. I was privileged to be able to show there. You know, it's like, oh, what a gift. Um, but some weird shit went down. And one of the things, and, and, I, and I bring this up because it was like, I always think of these like margin markets as canaries in the mine, you know? And one of the canaries in that, in that mine of the native art market, there was like, um, there was like four or five people that died within like two years. And they were major Native American art collectors. They never informed their kids what their collections were, you know? That was my, that was my dad's thing, you know? 
And so after their death, the museums were flooded. The market was flooded with this work that they valued, that they considered great, that was great, really well-produced, well-made stuff. But it, because the kids didn't understand the value of it, it coming out on the secondary market undercut the value of living artists. And in order to stabilize that market, because it was unstable at that point, um, the remaining collectors of Native American art sent a secret email to all of the galleries. Oof, not that time. Um, to all of the galleries. And uh, they were like, we're boycotting native ceramics this year completely to stabilize the, the market. And I was like, that's fucked. You know? That like, somebody who was making work 20 years ago when they were hungry and fucking trying to get a, a place in the world, working with these like bold ideas and really cool stuff are now competing against themselves because they were reproducing work that the market demanded. So now they're making work, but they're cush, you know, maybe I, I've got it a little bit sweeter and it's cool, but I'm still dependent on this yearly income. And so when there was a boycott, who suffers, you know? Well, you could say that stabilizing a market actually was good for everybody. You know, simultaneously, like, I don't make pottery. I'm not even in the realm of like, you know, what would be considered a, a customary ceramic uh, or traditional pot or form. And my work was, was also boycotted as, as a, a figurative sculptor, you know, but I was, because of the material. And um, I thought that was really weird. But then I'm like, oh, that can happen in any market. You know, and it does, it happens all the time. Like, things shift, uh, aesthetics change. Like, I, I, I do a lot of different work. I love making sculpture. I love taking up people's space, you know? I, I, I think of sculpture as um, tiny land backs, you know, where I'm like, let me take up that much land. In the most expensive real estate there is, your museum and your home, you know? That's, it's your piece but that's my space, you know? I like that about sculpture. But um, painting is in vogue, you know? Like, like th there's always these shifts between what people are interested in what they like, and then you start to realize that like, some of the things that are valued in that exchange is like storage, you know, transportation, like uh, all of these different components to, to the economics of it. So with that being said, as I'm becoming, it's, it's ongoing. I'm out of school. School's out, you know, but learning is far from over. So what I, what I learned in school, um, we ended up creating a, uh, there was no market for the work that, we, that me and my, my peers were doing. Some of, us, some of us had, like, good connects, and, you know, um, uh, because it was in the Southwest, there were, like, familial lineage, lineages that were like, okay, you're born into a tradition. You can move into that tradition. But some of the painting and, and, and stuff we would do um, was weird. We were like, uh, we started up our own uh, collective, you know, and it was members of, Manda of the um, uh, Institute of American Indian Arts. I had a warehouse space I couldn't afford. And so we were like, we should do some shows, you know, do some shows here. And so we would find musicians who were traveling between Albuquerque and Texas, and we'd encourage them to stop at our place. Um, we'd do it all word of mouth. We'd find out, like, every month we'd have a really nice music show. And then working towards that month in, um, in my home, it's warehouse space, we would all paint on top of each other. Um, like, uh, we'd pass around, like, seven canvases. It was like poker, you know? It was like, uh, if, if, if your shit wasn't good, you'd get painted over, you know? And so you were encouraged to make, some, make a bold move with the work, but then, like, you know, it's like, what tradition is this in? You've got tribes from all over the place painting on one piece. How are we going to divvy this up if it sells, you know? And we just, like, salon the place. It was called Humble, um, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, I mentioned earlier today, Humble is an acronym for help us make bail less expensive um, because we had to get, bail each other out periodically um, uh, from dumb stuff, college stuff. And, uh, but it was also a really good acronym on the building that we would go into and leave from. It was like, 
outside of what the acronym was for, the word humble was like was a good reminder, you know. Um, so yes and no. The, you know, uh, working in that space began to develop these relationships that were lifelong, you know. And so um, was I working and, you know, uh, at the time, working, thinking like selling work or, you know, having some sort of monetary exchange. Um, yes, but it was really low and we were like creating something that didn't exist. After those folks died, this is the, this is the collateral kind of like really interesting thing that, that sprinkled out of that was um, because museums collections were flooded with this market's idea of what native art was, they started to ask the question, what is native art? to like native people. Prior to that point, they were always asking collectors, you know, they had the power in that exchange, but starting to recognize that there was no long-term value in the objects that just flooded the, the um, museums and the secondary market, uh, museums, galleries, the populace, the artists ourselves, really started to examine, wh well, what is it? You know, what is it in the 21st century? What is it today? What does it mean, you know? And from that point, just like a whole, there's like a whole bunch of native, like, I don't know, you know how markets are? Like, there, this is a moment. I, I'm living in a privileged moment as a native artist because the larger art market is filling the holes in the American art canon um, with native art presently. You know, a few years ago, it was Afri African American art. Before then, it was, uh, you know, Latin art. They, this, this thing happens where they're like, okay, the American art canon has holes in it. We've celebrated uh, uh, white artists uh, extracting from all of this cultural knowledge from all over the place and producing a legit canon of art that is American. And then the rest of the globe was like, yeah, but is it? And they were like, mm, no, it's not actually. Let me fill in these holes so that even the people we celebrate have context to where this growth came from. And we can do it, we can set it in the past, we can set it in the future, we can, I mean, they'll, they'll constantly be knocking, trying to fill in those holes to create substance to the American art canon, you know? And, um, and it makes everything better, you know? But that first moment, you flood the market. You flood it with everything. And then they decide what's what, they don't care if it's good or not, they're just like, fill in all of the holes, uh, if it's solid, it'll stick. If it's not, it'll just drip out, you know? Um, that's where I'm at. This is where I found my success because I'm alive presently. I'm not making work that's more important than my ancestors' work, you know? I'm making work that's probably, hopefully, dumber than my future ancestors' work, you know? I hope they really push the bar and stand on my skull, you know, to, like, reach a, a higher point. Um, but I think what's really important is that when you start flooding the market like that, what you end up doing is you inform an entire population on what questions to ask, you know? And that's good. That's good. That develops complexity. And we need a lot more complexity in our, in our world today, you know? Um, nothing simple, you know? We tried, to, we, tried, we tried simple. Simple failed, you know? Let's, let's develop complexity. And that flooding, that whole kind of system actually it actually informs the populace. So now there's new questions to ask, which is good, because we can ask them ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Did that answer your question? <laughs> good night, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Hello. Hello. So you mentioned that this was on a loop that was Going. Yeah, is it still looping or did it freeze now? No, it's not looping, and I'd love right. to see the the images again because they're spectacular. And my question is: a lot of your images show um, work that's on the body in the context of a scene mm -hmm. um, that looks staged. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, for instance. For instance, um, well, and then that was that's a new another another layer of context to see it on a billboard. So I was wondering for you, what's the context that you love the most, or that you feel is the most powerful, or where the work lives? Because so these images will 
will live on, right? In some right. cases, I images are where our work actually exists for the biggest audience, right? right? But but as I see these, I wonder, like, oh, is that a performance? Were they performed? Are they are are they worn? Are, do other people wear them? Do they exist on a mannequin mm -hmm. as sculptures? Um, yes, yes, to all of those. <laughs> Um, they are, I design them as, um, so like, okay, so I'm, I have a compulsion for the, uh, knitted and crocheted blanket, you know, um, they're like, they're getting super cool right now and like fashion people are moving into them. But when I first started it, they were like the bastard child of everybody's, you know, history or Americana in, in general, you know, um, I stopped buying packing blankets because I was like, these are cooler. And they're about the same price, you know, even cheaper in a lot of places. So I would just get them from like thrift stores. And I loved them. I was like, God, these are out of control. Like, look at this. My, my grandmother was a quilter. And um, quilting kept her sharp as a pin, uh, you know, all the way to her death. It, I mean, it was incredible. Just the dexterity and the mathematics involved in maintaining this craft just kept her sharp. You know, she was witty, witty the whole way. Um, and I'm looking at these these blankets, and I'm like, "There's not a machine that's making this. You know, this is this is a part of a gift economy. You know, this is uh, this is these are really interesting to me." And like. Once I started making, like, I call them regalia. You know, I don't like to think of them as costume. I'm like, this is regalia. These are ceremonial uh, uh, forms or ritualistic forms. And, um, and I would use them in that way. But, like, I don't know. I tried doing a live performance once and learned that I don't like it. You know? I don't like the way it makes me feel. You know? And I'm like, I don't have to feel that way. So, but I do like, um, you know, film, photography, all of this sort of stuff. I have zero interest in it, except that we have interest in it. And so I was like, when I, when I left my grad school, um, I had an NEA grant, and I spent all of it my last semester on a kiln and a computer and a camera. Because I was like, these are the three things that I'm using consistently at this school. And when I leave, I need to be able to have, you know, control the means of production, you know. And so, and a 50-pound bag of beans. And I lived on that, you know. And the generosity of peers. And uh, I had a nickname, which is Watecha, which is like in Lakota. It's the, Watecha is the, uh, it's the like doggy bag. It's like when you go to a feast, it's a thing that you take with you afterwards because you have to take some food with you, you know. It's the Watecha plate. And uh, all, of my, all of my peers um, would call me Watecha because I would just, like, polish off their leftovers, you know. That last semester in particular, I was like, it's on the plate. Um, uh, I wish I wouldn't have bought the computer. I wish I would have spent more money on a better camera. Because between the kiln and the camera, that kickstarted my career. And I, and I recognized that, like, I don't have to be as good of an artist if I'm a better photographer, you know? <laughs> because that's what people needed. Like, there were better artists who didn't get that spot in the, in the magazine. This is magazine times, you know? Um, or online, you know, uh, presentations because their photograph was shit, you know? Beautiful piece in real life. We're not sharing real life. We're sharing echoes. So nail that echo, you know? And um, so I got into film and because of that, because of the demand from the populace, you know? And it ramped up. Like, it went from photographs, having good photographs for, like, press and stuff like that, and then the, like, whole social... Uh, uh, networking thing became a thing in the world, and I was like, "Dude, I, I barely, know, I barely have the capacity to care," and I couldn't believe so many people did. Like, I w when it when it was first coming out, like there were so many photographs of people's like breakfast burrito and and things like that. I was like, "Who cares?" And then I was like, "Oh, everybody, everybody cares." And so that's what moved me into film. And, and um, 
what I found was if I'm taking a photograph of it and a photograph is what's living, this is the ephemera of the work, then I can make something that's worn and not really consider it a part of the object. I can sell the, the ephemera. I can sell the memory of it. And I was like, oh, I can film the whole thing. And I was like, oh, if I'm filming the whole thing, then I can wear this work and do a performance that is for the land. I was like, that's the audience I actually want. I want to, I want to make work for the land, and then I can document that and sell the byproduct, you know, um, or at least share the byproduct. And at this point, I don't know where sharing and selling, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird space, you know. Um, but making, make it, and then we had a pandemic. Like there were just all of these movements in my practice that moved towards our demand for content, you know? And so I was like, oh, I can make wearable work and um, perform this work on the land, hire a friend to document it, develop a relationship with filmmakers um, and so that we have a shorthand, we can really describe what we need use technology, like I use drones and stuff like that to film. I have, I have two ghillie suits. Um, does anybody know what a ghillie suit is? It is that like camouflage uh, uh, sniper, whatever, military sniper, hunter uh, suit where you look like a Yeti or a, a Bigfoot or, well you look like it's a bush. I wear those and I'm like directing people and flying a drone so I'm like in the shot so they can hear me. There's like some of the images that you're seeing up here, if I'm not wearing the, the regalia, I'm a tree, you know? And I'm like huddled over there, like, okay, all right, now do this, you know, I'm looking at it. I like all of that, I just, it's like fun for me, you know? Um, but the, um, I think it was the, the, the public and the audience that moved me towards um, working with film and, and, and that sort of stuff. But I exhibit them, yeah, they live on mannequins. I hate them on mannequins. I struggle always trying to make the mannequins work. I've 3D scanned my body so that I could make my own mannequins. I haven't figured out a, a proper place to do it and it's super weird seeing yourself uh, 3D scanned. Um, Especially when you're like 44, you're like, ugh, looks good, looks good, looks real good. Um, but I like the idea of using my body because our bodies have inhabited museum spaces over and over and over again. And I'm like, well, let me have some agency in that. Let me make it mine, you know, let, let me make it my body. Um, and I don't have a crew making work for me. I'm not there. I don't know how to value that. I also don't know how to like, I'm struggling with it. There is a demand to have a, a crew working with you. But ooh, I am tyrannical in my studio, and I am afraid to impose that on anybody else, you know? And so I'm, I'm learning. I'm figuring out how to delineate tasks and, and move that sort of stuff around. M more often than not, not, like at this point in my career, I just make it hyper-transactional, where I'm just like, I'll pay you for a thing, and you do the thing, and, and there we go. You, you know how to do that. I don't know how to do that, so you do it. I don't have anything to say in it. Here's the design. Um, way more comfortable with that than like having somebody sit in the studio with me helping me make stuff, because I'm like, are you doing it right? You know? <laughs> um, even if it's like dumb stuff, threading screws or <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm like, Ugh. do it wrong, do it long. Do it right, sleep at night. All of these like country ass sayings that like my dad instilled in me. Um, yeah, so it exists in all of those forms. The, the, the regalia means a lot more to me, I think, than it does to anybody else. But because there is documentation of it and because it inhabits a, um, a fourth dimensional reality that there's duration, you know, that it inhabits, um, and that you can get like nice stills and stuff like that. There is an interest from the institution to show the, like I started doing the film to remind people that the regalia is activated, you know, that it's not a sculpture, 
and then I present it on a mannequin like a sculpture, you know? So there's a lot of contradiction in, in that, and I'm, I'm becoming, we'll figure it out, we'll see how it shakes out in the end, but I do like, I do like all of these, you know, complicated things, and I do like working with the, the material. Oh, the afghan, let me dive into that a little bit. Um, I could be making regalia out of some of our customary forms. I could be using leather, I could be using quill work, I can be using the materials that we used to use to make the, this, this regalia, but I'm not in a position nor do I have the time to hunt the animal, process the, the materials, and, um, and produce the work with the amount of care that is customary to the practice, you know? That, a lot, a lot of our visual language and form came out of the recognition that in order to create this, I have to take a life, you know? And so because I'm taking a life out of the world, all of the beauty, all of the form, all of the line, all of the intention, all of the ceremony is a way to put more in than you've taken out. I've taken out a life. So how much more can I put in to like reciprocate this generous gift of material? Um, I can't do that with leather. Presently, I'm like, I'm like, I don't know where that came from. I don't know, I don't know how painful that exchange was. Is there care, you know, and love in this exchange? I can't do that, but I could use an afghan, you know? And so I started using those blankets that I was using for shipping and packing as um, the hide. I was like, this is the hide of Americana. This is a part of this displacement story, and it's also a part of like an economy of care, where these things were generated, cared for, and um, created through the closest relationship to what I could imagine our original hides were um, uh, a part of. And so that's why I ended up working with these, you know, knitted and woven uh, materials. And then my, my, um, preference to use an afghan to pack a, a piece and move it from one place to another became an impulsion, uh, 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 obsession and an impulsive thing. Anytime I would go to a thrift store, or see them um, visiting other places, I was like, let me get it. And now I have like, just like racks full of really cool stuff. And, and I'm still, I'm, I'm messing with them the same, this is my cheapness, I'm messing with them the same way I did with that like expensive acrylic paint where I'm like, is this next sculpture worth the beauty of that blanket, you know? And uh, I have to really get over that because they'll, they get made, you know? And, and it ripples out beyond my studio in ways I can never completely comprehend. Um, and the digital platform is a really good conduit for that. That answered those questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I kept forgetting who asked me. You were the person behind you, so I kept slipping back and forth, but the mic... The mic anchored it. Yeah. How about bold statements? Judgments? Critique? I know you guys have been critiquing. You're all like uh, primed for it. I, I have something. Yes. Um, do you ever, I know that ritual and ceremony is sort of romanticized when we think about um, indigenous cultures. Do you ever incorporate that into your work, especially now that you're doing film? Um, I would say that everything that I've presented through the lens of economics, market, capital, these sorts of exchange, um, none of them are ceremonial. They are all, at best, ritualistic expressions. And, and I, I make a delineation between the two where um, ritual tends to be a bit more individualistic where ceremony is dependent on a community and a, and a, and a populace, you know? A particip there's a participata participation from a community in a ceremony, whereas a ritual is like, a, um, I don't know if the rest of the community is going to be down with this, but I'm trying to build and bond and create and generate uh, a connection to the universe in a way that's, you know, whole or healthy. And so at the edge of it, it's like ritualistic at best. But ultimately, I don't share a whole lot of information about what it is I'm doing when I do these performances for the land. 
I'm like, I'll just leave this echo in the, in the, in the record, you know, in a digital format uh, as a locked image or as a set of moving images, you know. Um, and just allow the audience to fill in all of those sorts of things. Like, I don't want to. I don't want to sell meaning to anybody. You know, I'm like meaning, meaning. That's that's for you. You get to complete the work as as audience or viewer or whatever because your context is valid. It's the most valid. Like what you learn, what you experience, your history, all of that sort of stuff. It's going to inform the work in a way that I could never comprehend. And I see value in that. You know, so I'm not trying to sell the ritual. I present it. They're like, you know, there are definitely folks who are like, oh, this is a ritual. And then in, in that romantic, like, um, culture vulture way where it's like, oh, this is, I mean, I live in Santa Fe. It's like the new ageiest place in America, you know, and that like, um, get to pick and choose from cultures around the globe to satiate that displacement, you know. That it's legit. I get it. I I hope I, I hope it works. You know, and and I hope you find a thing. But there's so much sacrifice in, involved in a lot of the um, ceremony that takes place that people are not comfortable with the sacrifice part part of it. You know, and I'm like, dude, it don't mean shit unless you sacrifice. You know, unless you make you let some blood. The gods want some blood. Like figure it, and it better be yours. Don't make it somebody else's. You know, um, that's. That's where you start moving into a, a real and honest conversation around the transformation of ritual to ceremony. You know, it's like, do you understand what's what the cost is? You know, we have good ideas around value, but we have shit understandings around cost. Um, and so that's a that's an interesting exchange. Hi, thank you. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying at the beginning about the songs being composed mm. formally through the land, and then now you're talking about the performances as for the land. So I'm curious about formal connections and like the specific sites you're choosing landscape-wise. Every, everything's holy. The whole thing, the whole dang thing is a... It's an ancient burial ground, the entire planet, you know? And so I'm even interested in the places we build over, you know? And I'm interested in what a sonic response is to our built world, you know? Like, when you sing that song of a un, a un uninterrupted landscape, this rise and fall in melody is like, oh, it's clear, it's there, I can, I can sing this, you know? But then you throw some of our architecture into that landscape and you start moving towards digital shift, you know? And I'm like, dude, we can still sing the land in those sorts of ways. And if the song is shit, does that change the way we build, you know? Does that change the things that we value? So I'm like, sing that song too, you know? Sing it until it, until it sounds good, you know? Or, or at least generations are comfortable with it so that we do reestablish this connection to the, the place you're standing, you know? The, the landscape that you stand on. So um, I live in New Mexico. A lot of my work is really built around proximity, like where am I at, what can I do? Also around, um, uh, there's like protocols with different tribes, different regions. And so oftentimes when I'm invited to a space, there is an encouragement to uh, establish bonds between institutions and their indigenous population, you know? Um, and I'm like, that's your work. That is totally your work. You, you know, they'll, they'll even do an introduction. They're like, we, we know the people, you know. And I'm like, all right, keep it up. It's long term. It's long term. Um, but as a, you know, you end up, there's always the threat of you becoming the, the um, poster, poster child, you know, or the representative. And I'm like, dude, I can't represent the people from out here. Like, I don't know, I don't know what their things are, you know? I'm learning with you simultaneously, you know? So like, I'm not an expert in a way that you're not also an expert. Like we're just, we're both Googling it at the same time, you know? Um, I might have cultural context that 
makes me understand a little bit quicker, you know, around some of the protocols that are in place. But those protocols oftentimes are like, what are the limitations of performance in site and location, you know? Um, what does that look like? Is it okay, you know? Um, and then documentation, like, is this a site that um, maybe folks wouldn't want to see, you know? And or the first, first bits of these performances, the first regalia I made, actually the regalia that is at um, University of Michigan Museum of Art presently was the first regalia I made. And it's customary design and purpose. They're symbolic of our monster slayer stories and I would take them to um, uh, mines or super fun sites or um, basically points of extraction on the landscape and the, um, the ritual I was performing was apologizing to the land. I'm like, here's a human shaped thing. It's not specific, it's not me, but it's the shape of a human. If we are gonna address the traumas that we've inflicted on the landscape as an extension of the traumas we inflict on one another, uh, a good place to start is to apologize, you know? to acknowledge our impact and ask for forgiveness, you know, or at least movement towards that. And so that for those first pieces that I did were, were, that's what I did with them, you know. We documented it, didn't really describe what I was doing or what the, the methodology was, but that was what put in motion this notion of like performance for, for the land. You also couldn't see or hear anything and this was what was really fun about it. And it's, it's something that kind of moves into a lot of the other regalia that I've made since. Um, the landscape became the choreographer. Like when you can't see or hear anything, you are moving across the land with the sense of touch, you know? It's like feel my way across this place. And that like awkward, not confident movement through a landscape I was like, that's choreography, you know? I'm like, make my body move to your will rather than me, like, tread on you, you know? Um, and so that kind of found its way into a variety of things. And then they, you know, also have gotten, I was like, White Sands. Lived in New Mexico for 15 years, never did anything at White Sands. We should probably go do that, you know? And it's a cool, weird landscape, but it's also entangled in, like, while I was there, the... Um, the military and like my filming was was postponed my <laughs> what is it filmmakers in here the golden hour you know this like you know as the sun's coming up or the sun setting down this beautiful like transition of light they were doing like a missile test on my visit you know during that morning golden hour and I was like that's real you know that's a that's that's real it was a trip but I like these. I like these ideas or these movements. Hello. Mm -mm. Oh. Hey. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm curious. Talk like that the whole time. Yeah, I can if you want me to. Um, you talked a lot about native art and like indigenous art, and I'm curious. Um, my dad is indigenous and I grew up around a lot of like native community and ceremony and that like cultural landscape, but I'm never perceived as native. Mm. And I think about that a lot in the studio because I don't ever think that I am making like indigenous art. Um, so I'm curious your thoughts on like who is allowed to make native art. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what is native art? Well, that, that's that's the, the bigger, weirder question, right? Like, what do you mean, you know? Um, I think about that, like I said, I live in New Mexico. There are these rich cultural traditions of ceramics, you know, that's moved from, from generation to generation. And that is like a visual language I have zero access to being from North Dakota, you know? Like me extracting from that is lateral violence, you know? Where it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reproduce your <laughs> Pueblo pottery or something like that, you know? Um, 
that's what was like when I started making these like Indian art pieces and regurgitating this notion, that's what I was exploring with. I was like, what is not, what is so far beyond cultural specificity, but still like hits all the marks of um, the market's demand, you know? I'm like, how, f how far can we, can we push that, you know? Um, <coughs> I mean, technically anybody can make Indian art, you know, or native art, technically, you know? Um, does it make it so? Not necessarily. And also, like, what is the grounds and the purpose of application, you know? Um, I mean, I, I, all of this stuff that I'm producing presently, I've made up a culture in this future space. You know, I'm drawing from um, points of reference from my ancestral heritage and lineage and stories and stuff like that. But I'm moving it through material. You know, weird material, material that was not allotted to generate or create uh, from a cultural context. You know, like, I would love the day that I make some powwow regalia for somebody, you know, but nobody would show up with my powwow regalia. I know one cat, this dude, Bobby Dews. Bobby Dews was like, we should totally, we should both, he was like, you make both of us some. We're going to go to Gathering of Nations fucking weird future powwow regalia. Like, I was like, all right, with you, I think I could. But they, they'd eat us alive, you know? Be like, what are these? And then I fucking show up with this mustache. They're like, who the fuck is this guy? You know, <laughs> who does he think he is? You know, I bet he's not even native. Um, uh, I think these are the complicated questions that move us towards complexity, right? Like, what is Native American art? Like, what, what is it, you know? How is it, um, what are the cultural specificity? And this is the like, when you flood the market, it's all, I'm already seeing it happen. Like, uh, what you're not gonna see a lot of into the future are Native American group shows in museums, you know? Like, that was the only access point to major institutions for a while where you were in some group show and you were exhibited alongside the museum's like antiquities, you know? And so you're like, it's like the we're still here narrative, you know? That's where the we survive you actually comes from, is in response to we're still here, you know? I was like, yeah, it's also, it's also fun. It's like our plurality, our, our, um, the we survives the you, you know? Like the, the individual does not survive. The individual doesn't make it, you know? Never, ever, ever. It's, it's inevitable, you know? Um, but our collective, you know, that actually moves through. And how does culture, like, carry all of that information? So these cats, <coughs> they're Northern Plains inspired, you know? I'm like, what would it look like if Northern Plains tribes exist in the future? And they're absorbing, recontextualizing, adapting to all of these new materials, these um, detritus of the present, you know, because some of the shit we're making now will probably be here in that future space. Almost all of the material I use for these regalia, they're all secondary materials. So um, the Afghans, you know, I find, uh, I store, I cut up, I, re I re-sew. The, um, the anchor and the platform for most of the construction is on used sporting goods. I'm like, used sporting goods legit, it's like anybody who's interested in, in sculpture, wearable sculpture or anything like that, ah, dude, I'm freebie, freebie. Use sporting goods is designed for dynamic movement. It is such a great anchor to build off of because it's like structured and relatively cheap, you know, as well. It fucking stinks though, like <laughs> it stinks. It's been used, it's used sporting goods. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good one to like platform. And then even the felt that I'm using is, there's a company in Albuquerque that makes, um, uh, I'm seeing if there's any in here, sound dampening panels for like shitty architecture of the 90s that used to be an office and is now a restaurant, you know, um, or a brewery. Um, the sound quality in these spaces is so bad. You know, it's so bad. And so there's like entire businesses and industries out there around 
uh, uh, repairing the sound quality of a, of a gathering space. There's one in Albuquerque that's called um, Submaterial. And they get Phil's felts from, from Germany on giant rolls, cut them on dies, glue them into these panels, and they have literal tons of byproduct uh, uh, that they've given away to every single school. They've, you know, they give away to artists. I, I get it for free. They're like, we want to do something good with this remnant material. But the challenge is, it's like what was once on like a 40 foot roll of really, you know, wild thick uh, uh, plane of felt is now like a one inch strip that's like 12 feet long, you know? So like, you can have it if you can figure out what to do with it, you know? And uh, I had a friend of mine was like, do you want some felt? And I was like, sure, this was years ago. And she was like, yeah, I went to this place. She's the one who told me about um, submaterial. She's like, I went to this place and they were giving it away. And uh, so I got some, if you want some, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have some. And I was like, absolutely. Uh, she dropped it off for me. I got back to my studio. There was 300 pounds of felt at my, at my place. And it was like in huge trash bags. It, I was like, great. I have to make something out of this so I can make something in my studio. You know, it was like took up so much volume and space in my, in my room that I, I started messing with it. I was sewing it and stuff like that. And uh, dude, I'm like, I'm always on the edge of like um, art and craft, you know, and that, that complicated uh, uh, intersection. And I was like pretty hard lined around hot glue. I was like, I ain't fucking with that hot glue. They're gonna tear me apart. Dude, hot glue is the best material to use to put felt together. Uh, like, it's better than sewing, you know? I was like, oh, this is legit. I'm like, can't tear it apart once it gets into all of the, the matrix of the material. So it's been fun playing with uh, felt, but it is secondary material. So all of this stuff is like waste to somebody else. And I'm, uh, you know, part of the ethos of this future ancestral technology storyline is um, how do we generate and maintain culture through um, through this landscape of like our consumption in the present like what's going to be left you know when we're done mining materials we're going to have to mine our trash you know we're going to be going through all of that stuff figuring out how to how to maintain a thing and then it's it's like recycling and the energy that goes into recycling and all this sort of it gets like overwhelmingly complicated you know and I'm like well, let's just make dope regalia out of it like let's make something rather than reprocess it and make the same thing again let's make something new out of it you know um, and then let's embed it in culture so that it's cared for in a way you know where it's not now it's no longer a, a throwaway material it's like valued in that way so all of this sort of stuff is is I mean I'll I'll start the loop over again but it is all um, by and large uh, in the in the film of of regalia and performative work, um, there is an impulsion uh, uh, and an obsession to maintain this like cultural context, which is um, that I'm making up. So, where is it from? Like, it's honest. It is the it is legit Native American. You know, um, there's always that. I I always get that that question like. Oh, it's so dumb. Are you an artist who happens to be Native American or a Native American artist, you know? And I'm like, okay, one's a job and the other one is a cultural context for 10,000 years. Like, you're comparing the two, you know? I'm like, I don't, <laughs> it's so dumb. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not even an artist. I'm just Native American, you know? I'm just Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara. I'm just a human being, you know? I'm not my job. You know, my job entails maintaining culture and the cultural context that I was raised on is indigenous to a place, you know? Um, so who gets to make that? I hope in the future, all of us. I hope in the future, we all remember that we belong to this place and we act accordingly, you know? I'll friggin, you act accordingly and you get to be Native American. That was the, that was the first effort that Native people did in uh, this experiment that is America. You know, it was like, oh, you think there's like all of these stories around like, um, you know, the, the worship of, of these people who came on these ships because they'd never seen a ship before, you know, and these fair skinned people came and they treated us like gods. We were like gods to them. I'm like, dude, you smell like shit. 
Like, you can't cross the ocean and smell good, you know? And we had a culture of, of uh, what is it called? It's not, I mean, it's generosity, but there is, there is like an embedded context. In most human cultures of, of um, trying to help somebody, you know? What is, the, what is this term? Like, where you're, um, you live in a home, somebody comes along, they want some water, you offer, offer them water, you offer them food. What, there's, a, there's a name for it. Hospitality. Hospitality. Food. I mean, hardwired in the genetic code of human beings. Hospitality. Like, just show me that, you know? Um, why have we removed that from us, you know? And it was effort. It was long and slow and maintained effort to remove our hospitality, you know? And it was, it was violence. It was, it was hospitality not accepted, perverted, and made dangerous, you know? Yeah? You have an idea with that? Yeah. One more question? Yeah. And then, yeah. Um, it's just, no, I don't really have an idea in response to what you last said, but thank you. Um, you had said earlier that you were open to hearing things other than questions as well. Is oh, that yes. still? All right. Yes, please. I just want to say that as a Nigerian currently in America, I'm thinking about immigrants, mm. potential immigrants, um, who also come from what they would call their native cultures and really want to preserve that. But then their art practice kind of survives more in, in a place like America where art seems, the art industry is, uh, is thriving or seems to be thriving. You know, there's more art institutions. Um, I don't know what you think about that, but yeah, no, there are immigrants in the room who are thinking about this. Like, I don't know. Please wave your hands. I don't feel alone. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, if you come from a background, like, particularly for me, I, I'm really, like, in that place where I'm trying to also speak to certain things about my Igbo tribe as a Nigerian and things that I want to pass on. I say things like, I want my, my son to see this work in a museum. It doesn't exist today, but like I, I hope they see that in this museum, I, I hope will exist in the future in my home country. But um, that quest is kind of challenged by the dynamic of having to move around to let your art practice even develop and survive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think these are these are the right questions. I think there's a there's another question that's that inhabits that space as well, which is and I can make this statement because I'm standing from the privileged position of having work in museums and, and, and stuff like that, but dude, y'all are the archive. Like our children. That's you wanna know what the greatest archive on the planet is? It's our children. Like all of us, collectively, the next generation. That's the greatest archive there is. There ain't no museum, institution, there's no other thing that holds information, culture, and relevance better than the next generation, you know? And man, we've been isolating and reducing what, it used to be complicated and complex and varied, you know? But we're purchasing in and participating in and expecting the return from um, the institution, the museum, the gallery, the market, all of these things to justify and value the things that we have and hold as special, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, when, when, when and how do we collectively shift that narrative where this power dynamic is, is transformed, you know? Um, and like I said, oh, that's coming from a position of incredible privilege. Like I can explore and think about that idea because of where I'm at. But I encourage us to consider something else. You know, like 
some other way, some, some way to support one another, to value one another that's outside of these towers, you know? Um, and I don't know what that is yet, you know? But I think survival, survival is a great one, you know? If that's like the, the limited thing that you can do um, and, and teach another generation, that's like, that's the highest form. You know, beyond that, everything else is like gravy, you know, in the museum, in the gallery, all of that sort of stuff. If you stick to it, maintain it, don't give up, you know, it comes around. It's a hard, it's a hard, art is a hard job. It, it's, it's an easy job and it's a hard job. The hardest part about the job is nobody gives a shit for most of your career, you know, and, and that is actually the abrasive quality that actually makes your peers fall off or, or encourage you to like give up, you know? Like there's other jobs that I can do. But there's like a limited few people who are so damn stubborn that they keep, they keep doing it. And one, they might be financially secure to do that, you know? So there is, there is, a, there is a, an economic privilege to the vast majority of the artists that are successful in the world presently, which is based on they can fuck off and it doesn't matter, you know? And they can express themselves, you know, really have an expressive moment. Dude, I want an expressive moment. I'm not even there yet, you know? Like, I, I haven't been able to express myself in ways that are moving towards indigenous fucking liberation, you know? Mostly what I'm doing is trying to help inform a populace on what are the right questions to ask in relationship to art and culture and native people. I haven't gotten to the point of being able to like, I don't know, fucking Rothko it out, you know what I'm saying? Like big block square, you know? <laughs> um, I'm not there yet. And it's already, it's a conversation that is, it's already, you know, in mode or whatever. Um, I don't know, it's, um, I don't even know if I'd want it. I don't know what my purpose would be if I didn't know, uh, I don't know. I keep, I'm, I'm rambling now, but I keep thinking this, it, it's come up and this whole conversation is making me think about it too. It's like, America sells an idea of freedom that's based on individualism, you know? Like, capital red, white, and blue, star-spangled, fucking eagle screech freedom in America is you got the freedom to choose, you know? You get to choose this or you get to choose that, you know? Um, we ain't asking who's giving us choices. Our fucking choices are limited. We have limited choices, and we spend our whole goddamn day making really dumb little choices as our freedom, you know? There's a different kind of freedom, a deeper, an older, a more natural form of freedom, which is, what's my purpose to my community? How does my, how am I, how is the shape of my community exactly where I fit in? You know, what, what's my purpose? And, and, and who is my community? And how does that extend beyond just like my nuclear family, my neighborhood, my people, my race? How does it look on a global network? Because it's always still true. Like, we, this idea of human beings versus nature is a learned trait. We've convinced ourselves that there is, uh, uh, that we've separated ourselves from it. <laughs> we have not. We are it. We are the same thing. And the hole that's inside of me and every consumer on the globe that I'm trying to fill with bullshit things is actually not in me. I'm the shape of a hole in the environment that I live in. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a you shape and a me shape in this beautiful connectivity, you know? Knowing where you fit in into that and what your purpose is produces so much freedom. Like you don't have to spend your fucking day making dumb, choices that somebody else has capitalized on because they control the choices, they control the options. We vote with this shit with, with our dollars every single day and perpetuate these systems in ways that are like, ugh, undermining the beautiful, connective universe that's outside of there, you know? Um, 
But I think there's an inevitability back towards that understanding. And I think in that space, this is why I say like the, the greatest archive is the youngest generation that's alive presently. Like what are we putting in that archive? You know, what do they value? What, what, what is it they draw? What is it they draw from? You know, um, how do they interact with one another? What are, the, what are we coincidentally, laterally, or purposefully teaching, you know, the, this archive, the storage of our, of our history, our culture, and our memory? Um, I don't know. I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff. <laughs> teaching a lot of stuff. A lot of them are bad habits, you know? You know my, I have a 10-year-old and a 9-year-old, and my 10-year-old, or 11-year-old, excuse me, he was just talking about his concern to be canceled. I was like, do it now, dude. Do it like as soon as possible. Like you're 11, get it. Yeah, get canceled like tomorrow. Uh, you, you got a whole future ahead of you, you know, like. But that as a, I'm like, how is that limiting his 11 year old mind for creativity and expression, you know? I'm like, dude, we all suck. Like, we're trying to figure it out. This is where the becoming comes from. Like, I'm like, dude, I ain't nobody until I'm dead, you know? And at that point, you know what I am? I'm compost. I am compost in process, you know? The best form of me will, you know, feed a tree or go back into the planet. Up until then, I'm like, dude, you're becoming. You're becoming compost. Like, it's gonna be, it's gonna be dope. The ultimate form of me is like de decomposition and n new actual life, you know? But beyond that, my children, you know? And the kids that they interact with. Like, my kids are your kids. You know what I'm saying? My children are your children. So like, how do we, how do we manage this? Because we're fucking up. Like, in weird ways, you know? And we've been trying to resolve these things for a long time, and there is some, you know, what does this have to do with art? Yeah, everything, nothing, I don't know. It's all the same, it's life. I don't know where one thing ends and the next thing begins, so that's a weird random. <laughs> Yay. Yay, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>